Hey, welcome to another episode of Talking About Success. I'm your host, Jack Canfield, America's number one success coach, CEO of the Canfield Training Group, and the co-author of numerous best-selling books, including the Chicken Soup for the Soul series and the Success Principles, how to get from where you are to where you want to be. And today I have an amazing guest that's come all the way from North Carolina to be in our studios here in Santa Barbara. He is a uh, low vision optometrist, uh, specializes in that area. His name is Dr. Edward Paul, and he is really successful with 90% of his patients getting them to be able to see again when they thought they wouldn't be able to function uh, correctly in society. They can now watch TV and drive and read and do all the little things that they weren't able to do before. So thank you for coming to our show and, and, and making people aware of something I don't think most people know even exists. They don't, and that's one of the biggest frustrations that I hear from patients who come to our clinic is, why didn't my eye doctor tell me that you existed or that the entire field of low vision optometry existed? And so basically most of the patients who come to see me have macular degeneration or perhaps diabetic retinopathy, which is a diabetic eye disease, or some other eye condition which causes a significant loss in vision. And we have been able to help thousands of patients from all over the world regain their sight and more importantly, regain their independence and have an improved quality of life uh, after our treatment programs. So people that have those two conditions that you mentioned, I'm sure going, hey, I'm, I'm ready to hear this. But for people who don't know what retinopathy is and macular degeneration, slow down a little bit sure. and just share for the general public because they may know someone, a family member or uh, you know, a friend uh, that has that condition and they want to get in touch with you. So talk about those a little bit. Absolutely. So the leading cause of blindness in the United States in individuals over the age of 55 is a disease called macular degeneration. And there are a lot of things we don't know about the disease, but what we do know about the disease is it primarily strikes people above the age of 55, primarily in Caucasians and Asians. People with lighter skin pigment with blue eyes are more susceptible. And if there's a family history, then that increases the risk. And what literally happens is that person loses their central vision. So Jack, if I had macular degeneration and I was looking you straight in the face, I'd see your shoulders, I'd see your body, I'd see the surroundings, but I wouldn't see your face. And so this is devastating because central vision is what is critical for reading, watching television, and driving a car. Mm -hmm. Now, most patients who develop macular degeneration don't know that they have the disease. They simply have noticed that they're starting to have difficulty reading or they're having difficulty driving at night. And so they go to their eye doctor thinking they need an update in their eyeglass prescription. And that's when they'll receive the devastating news that it's not a change in their eyeglasses that will help, but that macular degeneration is the problem. And that while we don't have a cure for it, there are treatments. And of course, in our clinic, we have some novel treatments that are offered very few places in the world. If I may follow up in individuals under the age of 55, Diabetic retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness in the United States. And this is a diabetic eye disease where basically tiny blood vessels inside the eye start to bleed, and the inside of the eye literally fills with blood. And as the inside of the eye fills with blood, the patient starts to lose vision. It really doesn't matter to a low vision optometrist whether the patient has macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy. In over 90% of cases, we can help both of these type of patients. Now, when you started out as an optometrist, I imagine this wasn't a specialty that you were into at that time. What made you move in? Was there a person, a patient, a, something you read or experienced or confronted that made you decide to do this? So when I started out in my practice, I was a general practice optometrist. I saw every eye problem that would walk into the door. Mm -hmm. um, and my grandfather came to see me one day for what he thought was going to be a new pair of glasses. And I made the diagnosis that my grandfather had macular degeneration. Now this was over two decades ago, and at that particular time, many of the things we're gonna talk about today didn't exist. And it really frustrated me that someone I adored, I could not help them. And so what I told my granddad is what most patients are told by their very well-meaning eye doctor, and that is, there's nothing we can do. You're just going to have to learn to adapt. And so my grandfather's vision loss actually started me on a journey it started me on a quest to try to find out some way to help the millions of patients who suffer vision loss. 
Unfortunately, I was not able to help my dad, my granddad, uh, uh, once we kind of developed some of the technology we're gonna talk about today. Uh, but fortunately, because of that, I've been able to help many, many people. Now, this technology that you have, did you create this, co-create it, discover it other places? How did this come into being? A little bit of all of those. Uh -huh. um, I have to give other people credit uh, for the majority of it. Uh, I found a mentor in Southern California, actually, who I went and studied under, mm -hmm. who taught me many of the technologies and many of the techniques that we use today. And quite frankly, what we're doing is we're taking eyeglasses and we're combining it with telescopes tiny miniature telescopes that can help the patient see above and beyond what traditional or conventional eyeglasses will do. And they really are quite remarkable. Now you brought some of those with you today. Talk about them. I or have. maybe show us and we'll demonstrate whatever sure. you want to do. Absolutely. So the first pair that I want to show are what are called bioptic telescopes. And these are used for driving in 42 states. They're legal for driving. And they're also used for other activities, going to the theater, watching television, uh, going to a soccer game and watching and seeing your grandchild on the field. And basically these are customized in such a way that the person's standard prescription is put in the bottom half. So these are customized, not a one size fits all pulled off the shelf. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to their standard eyeglass prescription, we put miniature telescopes in the top, which are like a pair of binoculars. And so the patient may not use the binoculars, the miniature telescopes 100% of the time. When they're walking or driving, they'll use the bottom part. But then if in driving, for example, they want to be able to see a traffic signal or they need to see an exit sign on an interstate, all they have to do is simply move their eye from the bottom lens to the top lens and it's literally like holding up a pair of binoculars. Wow, that's cool, yeah. I love it. Yeah. Now you've got other things. We do. We have a second pair, which is a similar concept, but notice in this particular pair, the telescope is not on the top, but the telescope is on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So this would work like a pair of bifocals. So many people may look at these and say, gosh, my dentist has glasses like that. Or the last time I watched a reality television medical show, the surgeon in the ER had a pair of glasses like that. Mm -hmm. Actually, the company that makes the glasses for me, Designs for Vision, is the manufacturer of dental telescopes and medical telescopes. Interesting. So basically what we did is we took a technology that was developed for medicine and for surgery and for dentistry, and we've re-engineered it to work for patients with macular degeneration. So once again, if I made a pair of glasses like this for a person, their regular prescription would be in the top, and the magnification that a surgeon or a dentist would use would be in the bottom. All the patient needs to do is say, Dr. Paul, this is where I need it focused. So if the person is an artist, for example, and they paint at 20 inches, we can focus this exactly for 20 inches. Oh, wow. If they want it for the computer, we know that most computer screens are at about 22 inches, so we focus it there. Most people read at 16 inches. So we focus it at 16 inches for reading. So all of these can be customized to do whatever the patient wants to be able to do again. And when the patient comes in, we actually develop a wish list. If you were my patient, I would say, Mr. Canfield, tell me, what's on your wish list for the visit today? And what I mean by that question is, give me two or three things that you want to be able to do again that you currently can't do because of your eye condition. Once I know what tasks you want to do, I can engineer the proper lens design to allow you to do that again. That's beautiful. Wow, you're just like um, freeing people up who thought that their life was over at some level in terms of being able to do the things they want to do. Well, that's one of our mottos in our practice is that there is life after vision loss. If you've been told that nothing else can be done, that's not necessarily the truth. I'm not gonna restore your vision to 2020. I tell my patients, I say, listen, I'm the see better doctor, not the see perfect doctor. But if I can make you see better enough so that you can drive again, or that you can read a prescription bottle or a magazine or a menu in a restaurant, that's life changing. Now, if someone's legally blind, can you help them? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, many of the telescopes, depending on the power that we use, uh, can get a legally blind person driving again, as scary as that may seem. Legal blindness in the United States is defined as 2200 vision, 20 over 200 vision or worse, 
We all know that perfect or normal vision is 20-20. Well, we can many times take a person with 2200 vision and improve their vision to 2050, which is legal in most states to drive with. And again, in over 40 states, these glasses are legal for passing the driver's license test. And so, yeah, we can get the legally blind seeing again, maybe not 2020, but well enough to function. So if I were to put on one of those pair of glasses, given that I have pretty good eyesight, but I'm wearing glasses, as you can right. tell, uh, can I see what that would look like? Absolutely. So I'm going to hand you the glasses that one may use for driving. Okay. But again, they're good for more than just driving. Um, you might want a pair of those if you're going to the theater or you're going to a professional sporting event or you're going to a concert. And instead of holding up opera glasses or taking your binoculars to the football game, you can put on a pair of telescopic lenses. I like what you, I have a seven-year-old grandson who plays soccer, so I, I liked what you said about that. Right. Let's see. Oh, wow. I'm looking way across the room and everything is very clear. Um, it's like putting on binoculars. Exactly. That's yeah. the concept. Wow. So what the glasses are doing are three things. Number one, they make everything twice as big. Mm -hmm. It moves the image to you, so everything yeah. appears to be closer, mm -hmm. right? Just like binoculars. And the third thing it does is it makes things much clearer. Now, depending on the level of vision loss of the patient, it may not be perfectly clear or plain, as many people say, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly well enough to, to do well. And you can see even being perfectly sighted, um, they're, they're quite remarkable. Yeah, it's very cool. I can read what's on that bottle over there. Yeah, <laughs> very good. There you go. That's very Thanks. cool. You know, it's interesting. My wife, when I met her, uh, was legally blinding one eye. She had... Um, been playing with her brother and sister and they were playing with a broom in the kitchen and she hit a light fixture she looked up and a piece of glass fell in her eye scarred over and um it was hard for her to drive because she didn't have that distance that you get when you have two eyes you right. have no depth perception no depth perception yeah exactly fortunately we were able to do an operation and restore some of that with a lens and everything but i i'm just saying this to say how important it is to be able to see because i lived through that with her when she wasn't able to do that so you're doing some amazing work you have one more thing over there that I'm really curious about. It looks like a headband and it's got some electrical stuff with it. What is that? So this is the newest technology out today and these are electronic eyeglasses. So if we look at the design, there is a camera dead center. And then on the inside, there are small screens like television screens. Mm -hmm. And for patients who have more severe vision loss, for example, a patient that may not benefit from the first two pair of glasses that we looked at. The electronic glasses work very, very well. So basically I can set this as a wearable. What I'm looking at are two television screens. I turn the device on and all of a sudden what happens is Jack Canfield looks like he's on a 50-inch television screen right in front of me. <laughs> and then on the controller, we have two buttons which make things larger or smaller. So I can actually enlarge Mr. Canfield up to 15x, 15 times in size. But the beautiful thing about this device is it auto-focuses. I could use it watching television, going to the theater, having a conversation with someone, or I can pull out paperwork and look at it, and the intuitive camera automatically refocuses and resumes from your face to the piece of paper. Wow. So it knows intuitively, using infrared technology, what I'm looking at. And again, it's just like looking at a 50-inch television screen. So it will focus on a face. It will focus on any distance object. If I had a computer monitor in front of me, I could put the computer there and it'll focus on that. A menu, it's remarkable. All of it automatic. It charges like your cell phone. So once an evening, you just plug it in. It'll stay charged for about four hours. If you were sitting at home using it at the computer or you're watching television, you can just plug it in and leave it plugged in. Um, but this is yet one additional option for patients with vision impairment. And Jack, this was not even available 12 months ago. So we're 
making some remarkable strides with respect to what we're having available now for patients. And again, it's my job as the low vision specialist to interview that patient when they come in, to find out what they want to be able to do, and then to use a combination of optics, physics, medicine, and engineering to decide what's gonna be best for the patient. And the beautiful thing about coming in for a consultation with us is we can build a pair of prototypes for that patient the day that they come in. So there's absolutely no guesswork. If you've got a prescription, we can build those glasses in the office. You can't take them home with you that day, but we can build them, let you put them on, walk outside with them. You bring what you want to be able to read into the office, whether it's your Sunday school book or whatever magazine you like, and you can test them that day and find out if it's gonna work for you. Wow, and if it does work for you, how long does it take for you to get the manufactured product back to the patient? Great question, so it's about three weeks. Three weeks. Yes, and, and we typically like for patients to come back and see me personally to have the device fitted. I, I say, listen, if you go to a tailor to have a custom made suit, um, he doesn't measure you and then just mail the suit to you. You have to come back in for the fitting. Right. Um, but we do have patients that come to see us from all over the world and, and we, we can ship the glasses even though it's better for the patient to come sure. back. Now, you talk about patients from all over the world. I'm just curious, in your practice, is there a patient that stands out that you really feel proud about that you were able to help? Yeah, the, the patient who has traveled the furthest to see me uh, was a Buddhist monk who came from Tibet in February of this year. Really? Yes. Um, and he actually stung, stuck around long enough for us to actually fit them three weeks later. He had family in West Virginia, of all places. Um, and, Where I and grew so, up. Yes, yeah, that, yeah. yeah. So he, yeah. Um, and he, he did remarkable with them. Um, but, but that category um, aside, there is a group of patients who are... I should say the ones that stick out to me the most, and that is there is a form of macular degeneration that strikes children, which is especially sad. It's called juvenile macular degeneration, also known as Stargardt disease. And these are kids as young as the age of seven who are diagnosed with what we typically think is an old age disease. And it's sad anytime someone loses their vision from macular degeneration. It's especially sad when you have a 13-year-old yeah. and you deliver this news. But what is so gratifying is the average doctor, well-meaning eye doctor, will tell the patient once they've been diagnosed, listen, you need to go ahead and start making career choices now in terms of what can a visually uh, disabled person do. Uh, you need to go ahead and accept the fact that you're not gonna drive. And imagine what a 13 or a 14 year old feels when they're told they're not gonna drive. Well, on the flip side, when these kids come into our clinic and we put the glasses on them and we say, hey, we can get you a driver's license. The look on their faces is just absolute wow, remarkable. So that's the most fun part of my job is telling teenagers we can get them driving when they were told they, that they can't. Yeah, now they can date and they can get away from their parents. Absolutely. <laughs> I think the parents in many cases are happier than the kids are, right? Yeah, that's probably true too. Yeah. That's probably true too. Wow. Now I think about the, as a child, any kind of disease that was going to stop you from being fully functioning, it's got to be hard. I'm just curious, when you put these glasses on teenagers, do they ever get teased by their friends? Is it something that people adjust to? What happens? Yeah, so they're certainly not pretty glasses. I think we can all agree with that. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just face it with the patient. I say, listen, I'm getting ready to show you the ugliest glasses you've ever seen in your life, but we're going for function and not fashion. Uh, right. Interestingly enough, I had a Miss North Carolina a uh, young lady who came to see me who was Miss North Carolina and she had this juvenile macular degeneration. And uh, she was a farm girl and she got the glasses and was able to drive and she comes to see me every two years for checkups. And I asked her, I said, Natalie, do you ever wear the glasses outside of driving? She said, no, sir. She said, they never leave my pickup truck. <laughs> but she said, I wouldn't take a million dollars for them. So yeah, there's some kidding that goes on. But you know, the, the kid has to basically say, okay, uh, do I want to be able to live a more normal life? Yeah. Or is the appearance of the glasses sure. uh, going to be an issue? So It's like a visual prosthetic. You give them freedom. Absolutely. Yeah. Amazing. So if someone, um, well, let me ask you this first. You had a main message for people. I'm sitting here going like, everyone should know about this. Yeah. And so um, 
So why do you think more optometrists don't know about this? What, what, I mean, are you kind of a missionary wanting to bring this to the world? And if so, are you, what are you doing about it? And why don't people know? I mean, this is unusual what you know. So we have one of the largest low vision clinics in the world in our offices in North Carolina. I have two locations, one in Charlotte and one in Wilmington. But there are certainly other doctors around the country that do what I do. Mm -hmm. And I would tell someone listening that if they want to find a doctor who does low vision, simply Google low vision doctor. Uh, alternatively, you know, they certainly could, uh, could contact us and we'd be happy to consult with them. But the frustration that most of the patients have, and I think I referenced this earlier, is why didn't my eye doctor tell me about exactly. this? Exactly. Because most of the patients that come to me find out about me from television shows like this, wow. uh, from newspaper articles that are written, from podcasts that I participate on, um, from radio interviews that I give. 75% of patients find me on their own. Now, when they go back and ask their doctor, hey, why didn't you tell me about Dr. Ed Paul? Their doctor will always say, hey, that, that's a good idea. You probably should see him. But it's not front of mind for most doctors right. because they're so busy. But what I would tell patients and individuals listening to this show is that if you or if a family member have macular degeneration or any eye disease and you've been told that nothing else can be done, if you've been told that changing your prescription glasses won't help, that may be true with conventional eyeglasses. But as we've seen today, there are other type of eyeglasses, low vision eyeglasses, that can help 90% of patients. So my message to folks is, if this is your first introduction to low vision, contact us or contact a low vision doctor. I would also tell you that there is life after vision loss. If you've been told nothing else can be done, it's time to get a second opinion. Okay, and if they want to get it from you, your clinic. Absolutely. Where do they go? Best way to reach us is through our website, dredwardpaul.com. They can contact us. I have a great staff who will be glad to talk with them individually about their particular case, and we'd love to welcome them to one of our clinics in North Carolina to restore their vision. That's great. I, I love what you're doing. I'm so happy you're doing it. Thank you. Good work, man. I love it. Thanks. All right. Well, again, talking about success. The, so many of us think that there's obstacles that we can't overcome. And if uh, vision is one of your issues and you, macular degenerations we talked about, this is a man you should contact. Contact his clinic. You know how to do it. You've got his website. And uh, there's a lot more freedom, a lot more opportunity to be fully functioning than most of us think there are because we live in our limiting beliefs. So you don't have to do that anymore. So thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Edward Paul, for joining us today. And uh, we'll see you next week on Talking About Success. Thank you for watching this episode of Talking About Success. Remember, your success is a journey. So for more information and free resources to help you, be sure to visit jackcanfield.com forward slash learn more.